Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of our Seven Investing program. I'm Seven Investing founder and CEO Simon Erickson, joined by my colleague Steve Symington. And we're very excited to welcome several of the executives of Rocket Lab to our show today. We have the company's CEO and founder, Peter Beck, and also its chief financial officer, Adam Spice. As a reminder for anyone who's watching, Rocket, Rocket Lab is now a publicly traded company with the ticker RKLB. Hey, Peter and Adam, thanks for joining us at Seven Investing and congratulations. Great, thanks, thanks for having us. us. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> well, we wanted to start, we typically start when we're, when we're chatting at the 10,000 foot level. I think it's only appropriate to start at the geosynchronous orbit level for this question. But uh, Peter, the first one's for you. You know, we hear about the space economy in the media quite a bit these days. Uh, some are saying this is a trillion dollar industry that's developing out there right now. You're someone who lives this every single day. Uh, how do you see space economy developing and what are some of the biggest opportunities you see there? Yeah, I think it's really uh, a pivotal time within the industry. I mean, as, as I was growing up as a young child, I, I wished and lamented that I was born in the, in the Apollo era because that was going to be the, that was really the, you know, the heyday of the space industry. But boy, was I wrong. I mean, uh, this is this is really the era, um, you know, to be in the space business. Um, and that's testament by the fact that, uh, you know, so many companies uh, are able to um, you know, create value um, within, within the industry. So I think, um, you know, we go through a time where space is typically dominated by governments and government programs. Uh, and now it's uh, it, it's it's really uh, starting to become um, you know more controlled by commercial enterprises and commercial entities. And if you look at the really really large programs, um, you know they are um, you know they're, 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 a lot of them are, are, are commercial. So you're seeing the shift from um, from from government uh, all the way into um, in, into commercial, and the you know, and, and private companies uh, and public companies now taking advantage of all of the opportunities that that is available, you know, in that in that space. We we've seen a lot of talk about satellite internet and imagery and data collection out in outer space. Are there certain uh, fields that you think are going to grow at a kind of an outsized rate rate out there, Peter? So I think my my view is always that you know perhaps the, the largest thing to be done in space is yet to even be thought of. But um, certainly the things that you mentioned uh, have have big opportunities. So uh, you know uh, communications is always a big one, uh, comms is a big one, and Earth observation of course is always uh, a, a large opportunity. But I really do think that um, there's going to be some some significantly more interesting uh, you know op opportunities in, in the future. And that's particularly born when you when you kind of do um, and you approach it kind of like what Rocket Lab and, and, and others have is where it's not just you know combining launch, building spacecraft, and then moving you know into into those applications and really flattening the whole stack there. Um, you know, create a huge advantage to to do things in orbit at a cost and a frequency that just hasn't been possible in the past. So you mentioned launches, um, and uh, I know you've you've been the leader, uh, Rocket Lab, for small launches for the last three years or so, correct? Yes. So. Um, yeah, correct. We've we've over a hundred satellites on orbit today. Okay, and, and there are I know there's kind of two distinct ways to go about it, right? Uh, and dedicated launches and, and ride sharing. Um, any way you can kind of give us uh, some some thoughts on the advantages of and costs of each approach and, and maybe how customer preferences are shifting in the industry? Yeah, so uh, it's the difference between ride share. So ride share is where obviously you 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 share your ride on a large rocket, and then dedicated is where you have uh, you know a dedicated vehicle to get you to where you want to go. And um, you know not all space is the same. It's it, this it comes down to a physics problem. Um, and the best way I can describe it is if you're sitting in New York and you want to get to Australia, um, it doesn't really matter if someone gives you a free ticket to the United Kingdom or a very low cost ticket to the United Kingdom, you need, need to get to Australia. And it's the same thing uh, with the difference between rideshare and, and small dedicated launch. Uh, if, if you've got a common destination and you don't mind sharing the bus and you'll get dropped off where you get dropped off on the time frame you get dropped off, 
then rideshare is a great opportunity because it's you're always leveraging the cost of a large launch vehicle and the lower cost per kilogram and you can get your satellite in, into orbit it's great but um as of with you know almost all of our customers they actually have a really uh, specific destination that they, they need to get to for their satellite or their constellation to be commercial um you know for example uh, if, if you're trying to look at, um, if you're an Earth observation company and you want to spend the majority of your time over North America and maybe some of the other, other troubled countries, then a mid-inclination orbit puts you over those countries. Um, if, you, if you want to, um, you know, provide communications to, uh, to say, um, in the continental United States, then you need to be in a mid-inclination. If you go sun-synchronous, you're only crossing over those you know, over the over the um, the landmass very infrequently. So, um, you know, for every application in space, there is a specific requirement for every orbit. And you know, if you can get on the bus and um, get delivered to a destination that works for you, then that's great. But like I say, uh, the vast majority of all of our customers have a very specific destination that they need for their uh, satellites and their business to you know to be commercially viable. Adam, let me segue that one to a question for you. Uh, we know that you all have been focusing uh, on the dedicated launches heavily, you know, the, the small satellites of 300 kilograms payload with your electron rockets, but we've seen that you've spent a lot of time developing the neutron rockets too, the eight, the eight ton rockets that I primarily, as I understand it, are more for satellite constellations rather than just single purposes. Uh, from a business perspective, what's the impact of neutron and, and how is that going to impact the future of Rocket Labs? of their company yeah no it's a, it's a great question i'll give you my thoughts on you know I'm, i know pete has others as well but you know, if you really think about electron it's 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 a phenomenal platform for doing uh I mean, you know bespoke type of operations right so if you want to try out new technologies in orbit quickly and affordably particularly as pete mentioned you've got a unique either l10 requirement or inclination it's a great way to get technology up on orbit get proof and then really kind of allows you know, those operators gain confidence in deploying larger constellations of those satellites if that's their plan, if, that, if their application requires a large constellation. So what we really view is we view this as just another piece of our overall strategy where we're not just a small launch company, right? We have satellite components for the for the small satellite market. We, we are building buses, full satellite buses. Uh, you know, we, of course, launch some on Electron. And also those, some of those buses will launch and components launch on other uh, launch vehicles, not to not necessarily electron, because when it comes to our space systems business, you know, we certainly want to have the ability to be launch vehicle agnostic. We'd love to launch everything, of course, on electron, ultimately neutron, but we, you know, we want a bigger bite at the overall ecosystem than what only our, our vehicles can provide. So when you think about what neutron really does is it allows us to take those really strategic early relationships and credibility and track record from those bespoke, you know, in some cases, Pathfinder missions. And when things are really, when the constellations are ready to go to, you know, into volume deployments, you know, we can just take those relationships and those capabilities and everything we've learned about those payloads and put them on a much larger launch vehicle and deploy the constellations in volume. So it's an incredibly strategic investment. Um, you know, I, I think that it would be it'd be great if we if we even hadn't had Electron or or the space systems business as it exists today. But it's that much more strategic and leverageable when with everything that's come before it. So yeah, we're incredibly excited about Neutron. Now, um, you mentioned, you know, satellite components and, and you know, kind of the end-to-end -end platform. And I know uh, your first acquisition you made just a little over a year ago. Uh, it was a satellite components company, wasn't it? Correct. Yes. It was a company called Sinclair Interplanetary. They were based up in Toronto. And uh, Sinclair was, was, was very well known with industry as making superb, very exquisite, you know, components such as, you know, uh, reaction wheels and star trackers and sun sensors. Um, and so it was, a, you know, it was a very, we, what we realized very quickly as we were developing our own photon family of satellite buses was that the lead times were very, very, very long. And, you know, one thing that, you know, uh, you know, Pete and the rest of the team, you know, identified really early on was that if new space is going to live up to its promise of becoming this trillion dollar, you know, opportunity for everybody, uh, it can't be done the old space way. 
right? So that really means you've got to you've got to find new ways, cheaper ways, quicker ways to to really get to volume deployments. And so, for example, you know Sinclair was de- was selling hundreds, you know, one to two hundred, for example, reaction wheels per year. Uh, we've now secured constellation contracts, which will be shipping thousands of reaction wheels per year. And you just can't do that the old way. So it's all about bringing Rocket Lab's, you know, ability to produce at scale, a high volume, high quality, and really bring that to the market, bring down lead times, not only for our own internal needs for Photon, but everybody else in the small satellite market. So the component piece is a very strategic enabler for us. You know, would it make sense as just a one-off isolated siloed business? Probably not. Um, for us, because it probably doesn't, in and of itself, wouldn't have necessarily the the profile that we'd look for as a public company, but it absolutely is critical, and it's kind of already proving itself out to be an incredibly strategic play for us. And Peter, um, that, that's really interesting, and yeah, I've got all kinds of other questions that pop up, but uh, I, I mentioned, uh, I heard you mention uh, some thoughts on uh, that the industry will consolidate, uh, that you fully expect it. Um, and you know that was, I guess, part of it, right? Uh, is is this kind of inorganic growth where you acquire a company like the satellite components business? Uh, any other thoughts you can offer on uh, industry consolidation for the broader space economy? Yeah, I think. I mean, our, our view is that the the large space companies of 2030 and on are going to look a little bit like Rocket Lab, where um, they're a launch company. They also build spacecraft, and they probably also have an applications business um, or, or a, you know, their, their own um, revenue line associated with that. And um, you know, uh, I think there's it, it, the space industry is kind of, and I think Adam said it well, is 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 really characterised by a tremendous number of very small um, operators at, at sub scale. Um, and uh, one way to bring scale to the industry is is by consolidation. And you know, as Adam said, if you go to most of the space space component shops and say, "I want 2,000 of something," you can just watch the head spontaneously can you know explode because it's just <laughs> a number that it. But you know, in the rest of the world, that is not a big number. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, double clicking on the applications one there, Pete. I think that it, it there's a large market for launch and there's a large market for the components and the satellites, but. It seems like one of the things that you're most excited about is just laying the infrastructure for companies to set up shop in outer space, right? It seems kind of like the early days of the internet. They had to lay the groundwork for uh, networking and, and packet information exchanges. And then you kind of got cloud computing where someone's got to build out the infrastructure for hosting software that's cloud-based. It seems like now there's an interest in laying the infrastructure uh, up in, in orbit. How do you how do you see that space applications or maybe we call it space as a service? How, how is that going to evolve in the next couple of years? Yeah, I, th- I think it's 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 fairly obvious what what's going to happen there. I mean, the when you have the ability um, to you know deploy infrastructure at such a rate and a frequency and a cost um, uh, that that that's really really hard to match, then um, it's going to be pretty obvious you know ultimately um, where all that goes. Um, and 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 that 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 will be you know um, you know b- building of that infrastructure uh, you know in in orbit and beyond. Um, and if I can follow up on that too, would customers then just pay a, a monthly fee or an annual fee to Rocket Lab just to to host all the infrastructure and and say hey you guys take care of it just keep my business up and running up there. Yeah, I mean, it can take all different kinds of models. So we already run uh, like a hosted payload model where, um, you know, customers can come to us and uh, with just their sensor on a photon and we'll put a we'll put a, a photon up on orbit and um, uh, and then, um, you know, we can we can host their payload and just provide the data to them. In fact, you know, we, we even have a customer that uh, we never built the satellite. We never nor we, did we launch the satellite, but we actually uh, just operate the satellite for that particular customer. So you can really think about this, um, you know, by is going end to end. So I mean, we we've tackled a lot of uh, kind of the the direction and what what we expect uh, the the space economy to um, how, the ways we expect it to change and evolve. Uh, I'd love to hear you know from both of you uh, maybe what a, a few things that you're excited about, uh, things that maybe investors should you're benefit from that the most are people that really do have this platform view where, again, it's not just bet on the launch piece, it's because, you know, you can win or lose the launch business. But if you've got, you know, Pete's always said this, you know, that you know, everything that goes to space, he ultimately wants to have a Rocket Lab logo on it, 
right? So if we don't win the launch or we don't win the bus contract, we want to have the reaction wheels or the star trackers or, you know, the the the, the uh, you know the, the high voltage battery systems, whatever you want to call it. We want a piece of that or we want to operate it on orbit like the one opportunity that Pete mentioned earlier where, you know, we neither build nor launch a satellite, but we're going to basically flip the ticket on on orbit services. So to me, that's what's most exciting. I don't think you see a lot of other industries, at least ones that I've been involved in or aware of, where there's that many ways to really kind of play at the table, right? It's usually you have one siloed opportunity. It's a very focused bet. Here, there's a lot of opportunities, but you also have to have the right pieces kind of brought together under one roof. And that comes back to the question you had around consolidation. And that's why I think, you know, cons consolidation in this industry is very, very important. It's very strategic. And there's definitely going to be a first mover advantage into who basically gets to claim some of this real estate in this new kind of wild, wild west. There is uh, so much good stuff to unpack there. Like Adam just mentioned, uh, low earth, earth orbit. Or, <laughs> easy for anyone else to say who's had more coffee than I had. Low earth orbit, the LEO opportunities that are out there. Of course, if you look at Rocket Lab's press releases, you see the diversity of opportunities of what people are bringing to outer space. Um, the execution and capital pieces of it, like Peter mentioned as well. Peter, I've got to slide in one more question for you since you've been a lifelong rocket scientist. I see some pretty exciting stuff you're working on. You guys are going to go to Venus and then you're going to go to the moon and then you're going to go to Mars. I mean, this is kind of the, uh, the lifelong dream that you're living here. What is something that you're really, really excited about that's a couple years out that's in outer space? Well, I keep having to readjust my, my expectations on peak. That's for sure. But um, but, you know, we, we do have some really exciting missions. Uh, you know, the NASA mission to the moon, uh, is, as you mentioned, is a really exciting one. You know, this is one of the first missions uh, for the Artemis program. Uh, and and we just recently run two uh, spacecraft um, orbiting, uh, you know, Mars for, for NASA as well, which is a real testament to the team um, because, you know, it's one thing to put a, a spacecraft in low Earth orbit, you know, doing a comms relay or something. It's a whole nother deal to go to another planet. That is that's seriously hard stuff. Um, so we're, we're, we're super honored, um, you know, that, uh, that that NASA, um, you know, uh, use the team at, at that level and, and also, you know, uh, trust us with those kinds of really, you know, fundamental science game changing stuff. Um, naturally, we have our private mission to Venus, which is something I'm very, very passionate about. I think that is um, it gives us, you know, the human species the ability to answer one of perhaps the largest questions uh, that ever, and that is, you know, are, are we the only life um, in, in, in our solar system, let alone the universe? Um, so that's tremendously exciting. But, um, you know, I, I think uh, there's, there's just so much going on that, that, that is um, there's really, you know, formative and foundational. So uh, obviously Rocket Lab becoming a public company, this is, this is something that we've been working for towards for many years. And, um, and and you know built, you know bringing a really high class asset um, to the market I think is 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 been really important uh, and um, you know neutron is is going to be a real game changer within the industry um, you know I, I keep telling the team if, if you're lucky you get to, to to design and build one rocket in your life that that's that's like you're already an incredibly rarefied year to get to build one rocket to take then to get you know, take all of the learnings from that one rocket, all the operational experience, the re-entry experience from recovery and re reusability, and get to roll out a clean white piece of paper and have a do-over on a new vehicle. It just doesn't come around. So, um, so we are we are leveraging and making the absolute most of that to bring to a vehicle to the market that I'm pretty sure everybody will stand in front of and and point to that and go, that's 2050, not 2021. Absolutely. Well, it's a lot of passion and a lot of accomplishment that's coming from Rocket Lab. We're really excited to see where your company goes, uh, not just for those of us who like science and who like space, but also for those of us that are investors as an opportunity for us now that you're a publicly traded company. Uh, for Peter Beck, who's uh, calling in from New Zealand, where there's a massive storm I hear going on right now. Thanks for calling in. And, uh, and Adam Spice calling from California. Gentlemen, we really appreciate your time with Seven Investing this afternoon or this morning, depending where you're calling from. Yeah, well, thank you very much. We, we definitely appreciate the opportunity and uh, you know, let's keep in touch as the story continues to evolve. It's going to be a very exciting ride. Absolutely. And on behalf of my colleague, Steve Symington, I'm Simon Erickson. Thanks for tuning in to this edition of our Seven Investing program. We are here to empower you to invest in your future. We are Seven Investing.